Amen. Isn't that beautiful song? And we know that when Jesus spoke to that woman at the well, did you know he took a special journey just for her soul? And God does that every day with you. I remember the first time I heard the song, I Come to the Garden Alone. And I had a vision. I mean, I'm just a brand new baby Christian. Heard the song so wonderfully sang by this wonderfully old saint. I come to the garden alone. While the deer is, uh, dew is still on the roses. And I just saw Jesus walking with me in that garden. Just telling me sweet things. You know, think about it. You are his child, right? And somebody had stolen you away at one time. And now you return home. He's got a lot to share with us and to show us we've been away. Amen. Do you remember the story of the, the, the prodigal son when he was coming home? How did the father reach out to him? Ran to him. See, this is the love of the father. See, And I'm really sorry for those that supposedly represent God who seems to talk about the wrath of God and how God is going to do this, you don't do that, and all that. And sure he is, but you know, when it's concerning to you, he's had a kind of a different plan for us, don't you think? Amen. I really believe that he's not going to let us go through all that mess. We've gone through enough. Now, I, I know you know that... The world's going to go through a lot of birth pangs, a lot of strange things. Where do we keep our eyes? Uh, up. On God. Very good, you guys. And the reason being is Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And by focusing on him, what does happen around us is so augmented, so strange at times. We're not as affected as much. Can you say Amen. Now, years ago, God told me to get out of the stock market. When my dad passed away, I had over $30,000 in the stock market. It was gaining a lot of money. God kept waking me up and telling me, get out of the stock market. Take your money out and use it other ways. And I was just going, you know, you know, you hear something. And, you know, Lord, if it rains by tomorrow, is that you talking to me? And so I did pull it, I pulled it all out, and two weeks later, it, we had the bubble burst. Hello. But I still lost a lot of it. Because when you trust in the arm of man to invest your money, you better pray over them. When you trust in the arm of man to operate on you and to cut you open, you better pray over them. When you trust somebody to drill in your mouth and fix all that dental work, pray over them. Why are we so silly to think that uh, we're going to let somebody that's not saved deal with our lives? Same with your business. You got business partners, people that use your business and all. Pray over them. All things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make a request made known to God. Well, I thought he knew everything already. Yeah, but you have not because you has not. Make a request unto God and the peace of God, which passes your understanding, will guard and keep your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. How many like that? Woo! You want to find out where that's at? Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. All right. We've been doing a new series, and I'm so fired up today. What happened? Did you get a little rest? Yeah. <laughs> Amen.
All right, so we've been doing a series called Reigning in Life in Christ. And this one's called Forget Not All His Benefits. I think Christians, as well as humans, periodly, we all have a forgetfulness. I think some is planned. <laughs> Others just is. And don't be, run, don't be one of those Christians run around and say, well, I'm getting older, I'm just going to be forgetful. Stop confessing that. That's not a good thing to be talking about way before you got there. And what do you think is old anyway? Look at God. You're just a baby. Look at Moses. He started when he was 80. Oh, we got this, got to get broaden up our little finite thinking sometimes. Can we say amen? Forget not all his benefits. So I want to read my paragraph, and then we're going to read the scripture that I have for us up there. And that's for them to help remind me to do that. Amen. And welcome, family. We love you, and our friends are watching. More and people are watching all the time. So we hope these broadcasts have been a blessing to you. And you, you might know somebody that's shut in. They can't get out, go to church. This ideal to take a service like this and send it to them. They can either watch it or not but at least they have church coming to them. Good idea. And we're all evangelistic as well as taking the things of God. Remember, it's the words, not Pastor Kerry, okay? All right, amen. Well, let me read it to you. So God has given us some very special marching orders for this specific body, but really it's for the whole body of Christ. Amen. And gave us a fresh anointing to carry that, that instruction out. Our Heavenly Father has equipped us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly, higher places. We've been talking a lot about setting our eyes up, moving and thinking, having a heavenly mindset. I had a brother, bless his heart, he told me, he said, well, you used to always say, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. You know, that's not, not scriptural. In fact, God says you better get some heavenly minded because it's going to pretty, get pretty earthly around you. Hello? Look at the people, the betrayal. If you want to take a look exactly what's going to happen to society, God gives a picture of it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, where it says in the last day, perilous times will come. First thing is mankind will become self-lovers. Be lovers of themselves. Everything will become self-centered. Look at the Christian church generally. Are you believing for souls and revivals, or are we believing for our own needs to be met? Now, there's nothing wrong with believing for your needs to be met, but if all your prayer is about your needs being met, then you didn't believe the first time when you prayed. Moving right along. <laughs> Thought I'd throw that out at you. In fact, when you pray, you're supposed to believe. Say amen. All right, so let me finish my paragraph with this. So God has provided... Every bit of provision that you and I need to live a successful Christian life. Do you believe your Heavenly Father would have you born in this planet without making some form of protection for you? No, but because of Adam's fall and his DNA, because it has a flaw in it, was passed to every human being. So we suffer because of his sin, but nevertheless we suffer. So we have to get that sin nature. What did we tell you sin was? Sin was the nature of Satan. So we have to eradicate our sin nature before God on a daily basis so it doesn't rise our flesh up and get in the way. We also need to present ourselves before God so he can make sure that protection is around us so that we don't become a casualty that, a casualty that day. Say amen. amen. I don't know about you, but I like good days. I like things to come together. I like God to give me his wisdom of what's happening, what to avoid throughout the day. That's his children. That's you. You see that Mod Podge out there where people are having a tough time, they can't get up, their things are not going together and everything? There's something amiss there. Let's pray for them and let's get some good training in them so they know how to resist the enemy. Amen. All right. And let, I'm finishing my paragraph with you. Okay, it's you and I, a believer's job, to search out all the provisions which have been given to us. 
Jesus died, rose again. He gave us all this kingdom, all these provisions. But I guarantee you most people are ignorant of it. And if they know that they're there, they don't know how to get their hands on it. Who do you think is behind that? So when we lift our eyes to the scripture, it produces hope, paints pictures for us, so our faith works for those things we hope for. So if the word paints all of these provisional pictures of what we have as a believer, shows us how to get it, what to do, that's why we need to be in the word. That gives us hope. Faith works for the things that are hoped for. And it brings evidence or material manifestation of the things not seen. How did you get born again? You believed, you asked, and you confessed, and Jesus came into your heart. Let me ask you, do you believe he's in there? Well, you believe it by faith. Can you see him in there? No, but you can sense him work it. Can you say amen? Same thing works with every principle. God said it, it is fact, not just a promise, it's fact. There's a kingdom that you and I breathe in and breathe out every day. But the only time we have access to that presence in that kingdom is when our mind is focused on him. As soon as we put our mind on him, zoom, we can sense God. When our mind is distracted and flipping and popping, we can't sense God as much because we're sensing our senses. And to be Absent from the body is to be aware of the Lord. This is another interpretation. And to be aware of the Lord keeps us away from being present with our body. So there's two of us. Everyone say two of us. The old man and the new man. Which one do you like better? There you go. So we feed the new man and we don't feed the old man. If you want an extra cigarette, tell it no. If you want to eat 12 pieces of pie, tell it no. Your flesh is a servant and not your boss. You have to treat it that way because it will complain. It will bicker. It will do things to your head. You know, it'll make things appear that are not there. I'm not talking about physically, but Sherry's mad at me. Sherry's got an attitude against me. See how the mind kind of fabricates that stuff. And you go to ask Sherry, 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 are you mad at me? No. Are you fabricating things about? No. You see? So we need to keep ourselves in the God's hands so we don't become deceived. Say amen, everybody. Amen. All right, so let's turn and read our paragraph. Here's what God warns us as Christians. It's the Hebrew Christians. Now, if you don't understand scripture, the, the Hebrews, these are born again, spirit-filled Christians. Jews, but they freaked out because Rome brought this dictator in that started killing everybody. If you didn't bow down and worship him as a god, Nero, then you were thrown to the lion, especially if you were a Jew or a Christian. So here the author is really trying to encourage the Christians not to bail on God. He's their only hope. So therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things that we heard. Everyone say amen. amen. Lest we drift away. Pentecostals call that backsliding. <laughs> I don't use that term anymore. We have heard, and lest we drift away. Don't drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape? Be raptured if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to those by those who heard him. One more. God also bearing witness, and also with you if you preach the word, both with signs and wonders, with various miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit, according to his own will. What are we not to do? Let the things of God drift away. Well, let me tell you the word. Let me, let me give it to you as God gave it to me two days ago in my prayer time. You see, saith the Lord, for four and a half years, the enemy has been buffeting my body. And they have been allowing him to do so. And it's caused a falling away. It's caused a, a drawing back. 
but I am not with those who draw back. But I am saying unto you, press on, for I am adding new life and new strength. I am causing you to grow. If you will press in towards me, I'll bring life out of death. I'll bring newness out of hopelessness. And I'll give you vision where there wasn't any. If you'll press in to know me, I'll bring fresh life. So now I am bringing fresh life around the world in my body. And those that come towards me will have abundance of fruit. And those that just sit will have hardly any fruit. Know that the vine dresser is the one that prunes the vine. And know that the branch must be pruned so it bears more fruit. So shall you, if you continue to press towards me, saith God, I will produce fruit and flourish you. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Now, you got to realize that's prophecy. It comes out of a human being, and I might have stumbled over a couple of my words, but take it for face value, and it's always supposed to exhort, comfort, and edify you. Say amen. All right, so we're going to cover these four areas. Whew. Since I, uh, the cloud clears, the cloud by day, i got a kind of a Holy Spirit cloud around me. Okay. We're going to cover four areas, and we're going to have fun with this, okay? So number one, we're going to cover, we need to study to show ourselves approved to God. We're not supposed to be people pleasers. Say amen. I'm not here to, to impress you. I want to be your best friend, your pastor. I want to do my best. I want God, when he puts me before him and says, Carrie, what did you do with your congregation? Well, I loved and protected them. You know, I want a good mark. Can you say amen? <laughs> Basically, that's it. And second thing we'll cover is knowing all our benefits. You have so many benefits. I bet you you don't know some of them. Thirdly, walking in the reality of those benefits. It's one thing to know about things, another thing to experience them. Can you say amen? And then fourthly, Walk in the Spirit, staying within your hedge. We're going to cover that again because I don't think Christians realize that God has put a hedge about you. It's only when you stick your nose out past the hedge and you start doing things you know you shouldn't do because he told you you shouldn't do it is where we can get shot, where we can get hurt. Now, I'm not saying that the, there's not afflictions and there's not sicknesses that don't try to get to us, but I am... I am including everything. If you'll go and if we could interview a person and why they, they're going through what they're doing, if we could break it down, if I could actually interview them, I could point out to all the open doors they actually allowed all this to happen. And it could be for all the right reasons. Did you know you could do the wrong thing with the right heart? What? No, you could actually think you're doing good when actually you're hurting somebody. Hello? Let's look at Paul on the road to Damascus. He actually thought he was serving God and helping God's cause. But what was he actually doing? He was murdering, killing, and persecuting Christians. So we actually can think things are this way, but they're really not that way. Let me ask you, how about these Islamic bums out there that are killing everybody? They actually think they're doing God a favor. And I've been coming against hate speech and these, uh, these mosques and these Ahmadis that teach all this hate and kill Jews and kill Christians and kill America, the big Satan and all that kind. I'm coming against their mouths. You remember Egypt? They wouldn't shut up and let his people go. Hello? Where's the body of Christ? Let's release a few plagues on them. Oh, Carrie, come on. No, church, you come on. You're the one that has the power. And you say, well, if you do that, what? what? No, listen, if I say God re rehearse your plagues to them because they're doing the same thing, that's completely acceptable. And if they start to get warts and frogs and they're having lice and all that, and they can't even go to church because they're itching and scratching and, and everything like that. Woo, hallelujah. Because when God does it, it's perfect and good. So you can ask, 
What if you ask and it's not right? Well, God won't answer it. Let me just encourage you. Get a little closer to God and you'll know this. All right, so let's go. Point one, study to show ourselves approved unto God. Who's the person that we should be pleasing? Amen. Remember that. Not Carrie, not Linda, not people, God. Amen. If you seek to please God, you're going to be pleasing everyone else. At least the ones that love God, or most of the ones that love God. i got to kind of watch what I say in that part. All right, go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at 14 through 15, okay? Now here Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, Remind them, remind these Christian teachers of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive or argue over words of no profit, to ruin those that are listening. Be diligent, or the word diligent is study, Study to present yourself approved to God, a worker that does not need to be ashamed. Rightly dividing what? You see, Christians, the church has forgotten to rightly divide the word. How many testaments do we have? You got to rightly divide them. The Old Testament deals with different problems, but we can get goodness out of it. New Testament is written for the believer of today. You need to rightly divide that. You need to know the seven dispensations that are written in the Bible. Same God, but different ways in which he dealt with the people. There are seven of them. I'm not going to give them to you now. You need to know the dividing line of God's nature. Everyone say God's nature. God is good. And God is perfect. So, Christians, when you receive the word, even my preaching, make sure it lines up with the goodness of God and the perfection of God's goodness to show you what he has for you. Say amen. When he deals with you, he doesn't bring you plagues. He doesn't bring you, and you're his children. He deals with you in a perfect and good manner. Say amen. Well, what if I sin? He still deals with you with a good and perfect manner. Why? Because you're his child, not a sinner anymore. Got to take a swig of water. Rightly dividing the truth. A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, church as a believer, we are before God to study our contract. Do you know the New Testament? Do you know it so well? How about all of its benefits? Here we are trying to fix everybody else's life, but you don't even know what's your benefits. Try using God's benefits for you, his equipment. It works better than trying to do it just ourselves. Hello? Two, we are to learn to discern what is of God and what is not. To study, to show ourselves approved and ready for our master's use. You're not going to be ready for the master's use if you don't present yourself to God on a daily basis. Because usually what the enemy will do is cake a bunch of cares and worries on us, and you're, woe is me. Now you're worthless for the, for the time being. As long as we got under the care, we can't receive the care. Guy said, real, I've been under burdens lately, Pastor Kerry. None of you. This is none of you. These are just statements. I said, what are you doing under them? Cast those burdens over on the Lord. Don't carry them around. How many ever had something on your mind? You just couldn't get it off your mind. What do you do, Pastor Kerry? Cast it over on the Lord. What if it comes back in 10 minutes? Cast it over on the Lord. What if it comes back in 10 minutes? Cast it over on the Lord. What if it comes back in 10 minutes? Cast it over on the Lord. Pretty soon it won't come back. Kind of sounds like the dove that Noah sent out. Moving right along. Thirdly, the enemy could not, or if he could, excuse me, and, and he works diligently at this. The enemy really works diligently at hiding every benefit from us. Showing us our faults, showing us others' faults, but hiding the very benefits that God has provided so well. Did Jesus go to hell and back? 
and he gave us things, didn't he? Wouldn't he want us to have those things? So the enemy tries to hide them. Because if you don't know they're there, you can't spend it. If you don't have something in your bank account, you can't spend it. If you don't know what's waiting there for you, you can't get your hands on it and use it. So he hides things in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds. All right, let's go on. So it's up to us to begin to proceed towards God to obtain them. It takes focus and concentration, seeking after God, putting him first. Once we do that, we cut the devil right out. And then when God speaks to us, coming right down the hotline, privately. And if you get really close to God, he'll tell you things that nobody else could hear. Let me quote you. John 16 says, and he will show you things to come. He will take a mind and declare it unto you. The word declare means to declare it in such a way you understand how it functions. Hello? We're in the school of Holy Ghost. All right. Here's another scripture for you. How many here know that every good and perfect gift comes from God? Go with me to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. A lot of Christians are really young. And they're trying to take on the world. No, just get to church and get trained. But solid food, verse 14, belongs to those that are of full age. And then it tells us what a full age is. That is, those by a reason of practice or use have their senses what? Exercise. How many know you have five physical senses, right? How many know that they have good input and bad input. You have to discern what is the bad input, what's the good input. Hello? To regulate what's emotional, what's not emotional, you're in charge of that. Then when we take that and we turn it over to the Lord, he begins to exercise us in the areas we need exercises so our senses no longer rule us. You might see something strange with your eyes, but God in you says you can change that. You might hear something odd with your ears, but God says you can take my word and speak against that. You see, so we don't take what we sense as God we take God as God, and we change our surroundings by the application of the word and his gifts. Can you say amen? Our job is to move through this life and win as many souls and touch as many lives as we can. Our second point, knowing all our benefits. Boy, that should be fun. Go with me to Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5. There is so many, I couldn't list them all and get it done in the sermon. But we're going to have fun looking at some. Psalms 103, verse 1. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his. We're terrible forgetters. I'm going to show you that in a minute. So everyone, don't claim that. I show you why we forget, too. And forget, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives how many of all our sins? You see, a child of God, all your sins are forgiven. Past, present, and? That's a real hard one to grasp. That means because he's changed you, you're not a sinner. Needing Jesus, you have Jesus and make mistakes. So now he treats you as a child of God. That's the difference. He doesn't open up crevices in the earth and swallow his kids. Nor does he send his kids into the hands of Satan to have Satan teach him to love God more. That's what Christians are telling. People are going to go through the tribulation. They're going to kiss faces with the Antichrist. Listen to me, there's no good news in that. There's no Jesus in that. 
every instant, every little instant that I see where God's people get into trouble, God always comes and rescues the righteous, doesn't he? Can you point out any place in the Bible where he didn't do that? So why are we allowing people to teach us who don't know God, and if you check with them, haven't got much of a personal relationship with him, telling you you're going to go through the tribulation? Read what it says about the tribulation. It's the wrath of God upon the earth for a rejection of God. Did you reject God? So why would God put you in the punishment for the devil? He wouldn't, would he? And people that teach that are in error. And Satan loves it. They preach what I call pan out in the end. Are you pre-trib? Are you post-trib? Nope, I'm pan out trib. Listen, you're ignorant of God's word, guy. And to me, I want you to know more about your God if you're going to represent him. Amen. Ooh, that was an ouch burn to the church, but that's exactly a rebuke from God. Don't represent God if you don't know me. So what are we all doing? We're getting to know him. Say amen. amen. All right, let's move on. Okay. Look what it, the rest of this says. Who heals all our diseases, who redeems our life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, not negative, so that your youth is renewed like what? Peggy. If you apply that, you'll be having more youthful strength. BJ, more youthful strength. But if we're looking everywhere else, talking about everything else, we're not moving in towards God. Let's look at this one other one here I want to show you. How many here know that we have a tendency sometimes, and we don't mean to, to take things for granted? And, and again, everyone, I say things like everyone, oh, yeah. No, how about the Israelites? Do you think they had a problem? Taking things for granted? Sure, we're going to go to a passage of scripture here. It's going to tell you a warning comes from God to all of us. He says, beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments. In the New Testament, it would be his principles. His judgments in the New Testament would be his discerning his ability to discern and his statutes. Those are his requests, such as don't forsake coming to church. Don't forsake to pray when you pray, when you fast. Doesn't say if you pray, if you fast. See, those are statutes, New Testament statutes. God never forces us to do anything. But he strongly suggests we do. Say amen. Good, you got me. All right. He says, lest when you have eaten, listen to this, when you have eaten and are full, you have built beautiful houses and dwelt in them. And when you have herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, when your heart is slipped up that you forget the Lord thy God who brought you out of bondage and out of the house of bondage. Where do you think the church has been for four years? Have we forgotten what God has done through his son? Have we laid down and let the COVID run over you? The church down the street is completely show because somebody told them there's a new strain of Kizitia out there. Fear is not our motivation. God is. Amen. All right. And it goes on. Don't, you, don't forget about the Lord. Then it goes, verse 15. Who led you through the great and terrible wilderness in which the fiery serpents and scorpions and thirst and thirst and all the other things where there was no water, who brought water you out of a, fil a flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, and he goes on and on. And then in verse 18, he says, 
And you shall remember the Lord. How many times have remembrance is here? For it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant in the earth. God wants you wealthy. He doesn't want you filthy rich. He wants you to have enough, always to have enough, and plenty for others who need some. That's a healthy walk. Amen? Having a big home but not being able to care for it is really not God. Now, I'm not coming against any of you. I'm just telling you, God would not bless me with a beamer if I can't afford the insurance. Come on, God's completely practical. Has he given you a house or has he taken good care of it? Given you a car, how about its condition? You checked the oil lately? See, God, we're, spo we're supposed to be good stewards of what God has given us and not so much running around getting in everybody else's business. Come on now. Say, oh me. God wants you to do well, you to prosper, you to be healthy. Why? So you can bless others and tell them who made you that way. That's the only reason God made me this way. Now, if you remember, there was a king in, in the book of Daniel named Nebuchadnezzar, and he favored the Israelites, and so God blessed him and gave him a kingship. And he gave God all the credit for a long time. Pretty soon he started taking all the credit back and, and bragging, saying, I did this and I did this and I'm going to do this. You know where he ended up? Sure you do. He ended up in the field eating grass like some kind of a cow. Grew hair, long fingernails. What kind of a lesson is that for us to learn? Stick with God. Don't take any credit yourself. All right, and moving right on, could you say amen? Let's go to our next point. Walking in the reality of these benefits. So let's look at what these benefits are. How many here born again? How many here have God in you? How many here have the word of God? You have the Holy Spirit. You have the angels. You have the armor. You have the blood. You have the covenant. Hello? That's just the beginning. You have the gifts. You have the powers. All resident because you have God on the inside of you. Now let me ask you, what does the devil have? Oh, yes, he does. He has an ability to con you because you're not in the word. Look at the condition of your body. Are you all beat up? Who do you think did that? Now, if you want some changes, you're going to have to act on the word. You're going to have to be a doer of the word. I'm not picking on you. But we're all going to have to do that. I can't do the word for you. You can't do the word for me. And please, don't get mad at me if I point out something you may be doing wrong. People, some people think that's a personal attack. Come on, Bubba. If I look at you and I say, you're doing it wrong if you just did it this way, is that a personal attack? See how you guys can't even answer me. Of course it's not. But you know, this last generation, the generation before that, can't receive any kind of correction. The moment you talk to help them, they think you're on their case. Who do you think's behind that? Don't you be like that. All right, so James chapter 1. Let's find out some of these realities. Verse 22, please, to 25. But be doers of the word. What? What? Come on, people. See, the problem with the church is you thinkers. I know I got to get around to it. Here you go. There's a round to it. Sorry, Sherry. I threw it where there was nobody on. Around to it. Now you have no excuse. You're, you're a studier, so you're always looking on your notes. So anyway, so let's look at this. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Okay, why? Okay. For if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing what? Your natural man. How many here get up in the morning and you sit, you're with your natural man? 
But how many know that's not the real man? The real woman. No, the real man and woman are your spirit and your soul. Your body's going to be ejected. When you're resurrected, God's going to have to make it brand new. So when you look in the mirror, see God in you. Look past your flesh. Remember I told you, we do not honor the flesh of man. We know no man after the... That includes yourself. Stop reflecting your failures. Stop talking about all the things that's not working in your life. Start focus on how God wants to work and start becoming a doer of the word. You're really good at what you do in the word because you've been doing it for a while. Hello? Things that you haven't done, you're a little bit iffy with, but if you do them, you'll get better at it. That's what this enemy doesn't want. He wants us really good at what we do, but very bad at what we do for God. Hello? And so we don't look in the mirror and look at our natural man because we are doers of the word. There's another place that says we, with an open face, beholding in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being changed in the same image. That's 2 Corinthians 3.18. So the idea is we don't look after our natural person. We take care of it. We bathe ourselves, brush our teeth, make sure we look pretty. We don't stink. Hello? Because some people have hygiene problems and need to really be clean. But he says, but for he observes himself and goes away and look at this next phrase and immediately what? Immediately forgets. You see, the more we concentrate on ourselves, the more we forget what God has given us in our benefits. For example, a person that's really focused on how come they're sick will never see how to be healed. Are you with me? That's a trick of the enemy. So if you have infirmities in your body, you shouldn't figure out what it, why, what the cause is. You know by his stripes you're healed. Now you need to act and do the word. The Bible says faith without corresponding actions is dead. So if you believe you're healed, you've got to get up and act like it. What if I don't feel better? Faith in action will bring healing. Faith sitting still, you won't have nothing. Let me tell you a quick story. This guy called me up. He always called me up the wrong time. And he would say something like this while I, and I'm praying. He would say to me, now, pastor, God told me to call you. I'm praying. God didn't tell me. He says, I'm sick, Pastor. I need you to come home. I got the flu. I can't keep anything down. Would you come and pray for me? I says, I'll be right there. Grabbed my oil, went up there. I got in the house. His wife's in the, and he's on the couch, and he's just shaking and everything. I said, you ready to get healed? He says, I certainly hope so. I says, you're not going to get healed. Why are you so mean to me? I said, stick your lip out. Really, this guy I knew real well, so I wouldn't do that to you. And I says, look, what I'm going to have your wife do is make you a sandwich, because when I pray for you, you're going to be healed. Well, what if I don't get healed? You hear what? Yeah. This is stuff. Yeah. And naturally, you know enough now, you would go, gosh, let me at him, you know. But God said, be patient with him, because he, you know, Whatever. So I mean, his wife made a sandwich. He says, now when I pray for you, I'm going to do it according to James chapter 5. That says, that's the one that covers everything. He says, call for the elders of church. You call for me. Let them pray the prayer of faith over you. If you've sinned, they will have forgiven you. If you've done anything wrong, have forgiven you. And the prayer of faith will save or heal the sick. And the Lord will raise you up. Are you ready for that? Yes. So I prayed for him. The power of God was right there. Once I, lay, I picked up my hands, I says, now get up and eat your sandwich. He sat there and he said, oh. I said, get up and eat that sandwich. Now remember, I know the guy, so it's going to sound really odd. He looks at me, picks the sandwich up. I said, put your lips around it and eat it and swallow it. And he did. He was instantly restored. 
Faith without corresponding actions as if you already got it. Faith calls the things that are done or the things that are not as though they are and the things that are not to bring them to pass. Now, I'm not talking about weird, whacked out faith. Just God wants us to trust him. Can you say amen? Believe in his word. Remember, you're a child of God. No longer a sinner. Are you getting anything out of this? Can, I got the egg, so I have to take some water. So, he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, that's your Bible. What is it? It's a law of liberty. You find the law of liberty in Romans 8, 2. Write that down. The law of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. I quoted it for you. Then it goes on and it says, when you look into the perfect law of liberty and continue in it, you will be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This person, this one shall be blessed in what they do. Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? You want me to get that for you? Ah, you got it. Extendo arms. Professor Gadget. Okay. A couple of points I want to give you. Number one, if we do the word, we'll experience the benefits. You don't have to get your hands on them. You already have them. They just have to manifest. Say amen, somebody. We just can't wish them. We have to believe for them. And if we don't study our contract, we won't even know they're there. How can we have faith to what we hope for if what we hope is no more than the problems we see? Look up, my friends. Jesus, look up. Once cometh our help. He told Gehazi, Elijah did. Ah, there are more with us than there are with them. Open my servant's eyes and have him look up. Did you know there's more with us than there are with the devil? Did you know there's more angels in this room than there are with people? At least two of them for every person here. And yet you can't see them, and yet because they're not in sight, and because other than the word, we're not aware of them, you need to know the benefits that you have. And you need to know them so well that if the thief comes to your house, you already got no want to hear. When the devil come try to get you going, I praise the Lord. Amen. What's that uh, knocking on my door? So I got up to went to see what the knocking was for. There stood the devil with a box addressed to me. He says, come here, son. I got something for you to see. He says, why would God send it if here by you? The devil said, he always sends me when there's dirty work to do. He says, but I don't want it, anything you have. I rebuke what you stand for, and I'm a love, and, the, and then he goes on. It's a beautiful song called The Package. Get it? It's a good one to send to your kids. Amen. Just a wonderful song about don't answer the door if the devil wants to hand you something. How many here have ever had a salesman to the door? Did you sign for it? How many has ever gone out for an estimation on your car or something and you, you got more than one? Very smart. Who gives us our advice? Point two. You and I must rise up and present ourselves to God so we can walk in the Spirit in love. Can you say amen? Folks, we're to walk in love, right? Now, the love that we're to walk in, here's the thing. It isn't human love. Your love cannot love people that hate you, that spit at your name. But God can. We have God's love. So we need to learn as a Christian how to release the God part in us and stop living for God. Live through God. Say amen. Go with me to Galatians chapter 5. Let's look at this. How many here know God wants us to walk in the Spirit? 
But did you know he wants us to live in the spirit too? Where Satan can't mess with us? Can Satan get in the spirit? No, and Satan is not a spiritual being. He was stripped. All he can do is shout at you. Satan can't read your mind, so he suggests and watches your face in reaction to his suggestions. He might call you a real ding-dong, and if you believe it, your face is going to show it. How about, hey, you sent out your little colon cancer test and came back positive. But you know over 70% of those are misread? And by the way, I got a stack of them like that. And I asked God, you want me to do this? And he says, did I ask you to do that? I says, no. He says, they ask you to do that. Give some money. The more they send it out, they get so many thousand dollars per the one they send you. Naturally, they're going to ask you if you want another one. Well, I thought it was a preventative thing. It's supposed to be. But is it proven? How about this vaccination stuff? I believe in vaccinations. But don't tell me there's snake venom in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, I'm not putting down all that. It's just crazy stuff. I have to go to God about everything because these are crazy times. Say amen. And he gives me a peace that passes all understanding. He fills my heart with a love that passes knowledge. And I'm full of joy. Amen. So let's look at this. This I say, walk in the what? Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust or desires of your flesh. For the flesh has its own ideas. Lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, so you cannot do the things that you wish. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under that kind of law of bondage. Now, Cannot do the thing. You see, a double-minded man's unstable. So a Christian that doesn't know that their flesh, they can't trust it. They're to present it to God and have it crucified on a daily basis. A Christian that doesn't do that, their flesh is going to oppose them. Flesh against the spirit. Spirit against the flesh. Flesh against the spirit. Spirit against flesh. flesh. And that's double-mindedness, isn't it? What does James say about double-mindedness? A person with double-mindedness can't receive a thing from God. So Satan gotcha. Gotcha, little turkey. Don't give the devil something to work with. How do I know I'm double-minded? How long do you sit on the couch and try to figure out your day? You should have gone to God and have him lay it out for you. Amen. Amen. I know I'm bashing you a little bit, but I want you to kind of, we've got great things to do. How are we doing, dear? She gives me the okay signal. That's great. My last point, everyone say last point. Okay, it's in Job chapter 1, so you go there. So let me finish up in Galatians. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such there is no law or bondage. And those that are in Christ have crucified the flesh. You see that? You see, the devil isn't all our problem. He needs our flesh to work with us. So if your flesh is dead daily and crucified, you say, Lord, I lay my flesh at your feet. I'm a living sacrifice, Lord, crucify it in Jesus' name. There's nothing to be tempted by. Hello? Nothing to be tempted by. Nothing to be distracted by. Because the devil needs your flesh. He can't just show up. He needs your flesh to listen and to believe what he's saying. And, you know, help you point out people's faults and get all caught up about that. Negative things and then we don't pray about it. But we, should, we do. But you see what I mean? Okay, let's get through this. But it says, and those who have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires, but if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You see the living in the Spirit? God has a complete different realm for you, a place to live. And that's why we're not to compare our Christianity with other Christians. Because God is a personal God to you, 
and other Christians can help support and build each other up, but you're not in competition with anybody. Your job is to get as quick and close and, and as on fire to God as you possibly can get. It's a personal deal with you and God. My job is to give you what you need to understand that it's there and encourage you to go after it and then pray for you. My job is not to straighten out your life or meddle in your family or pick on your color or your race. My job is to give you the word of God and pray for you that you begin to carry it out. And enjoy the benefits. Enjoy the benefits. All right, last scripture, and we're going to turn you loose. This is a good one. Did you know as a Christian, you have a hedge about you? Let me explain. Everybody, before they were born, they were with God. Do you believe that? Before the world was found, I knew you, he said. And then when it came time for you to be born... God put your spirit and your soul, your personality, in the embryo in your mother's womb. So there was a, <clears throat> a pregnancy, and the moment there was conception, God had put the soul and the spirit in that body of that little embryo. That's you. Can you say amen? And to abort that is to steal the life of that person, and you are on the chopping block in God's eyes. Do not abort. People that abort, pray that they have the plague. Now, there are certain women that go in for abortion don't know any better. God knows how to deal with them and people that are traded up to adopt their child, but people that are cutting out flesh and they're selling it, they need a plague, okay? We don't want to even talk about it. It's, just, it's a shame to even talk about those things. And we know there's lots of curses in this land, but who is our God? Who do we pray to change this nation? To change the direction. All right, so when you are a born as a human being, when you're born as a human being, God puts a hedge on a human being. Every human being that's ever born in the planet gets a hedge about them. And that hedge will last as long as that child or the parents of that child don't tear it down. It's a grace-given gift to help that child grow. Now, we know some children die at birth. We know all kinds of crazy things happen. But if you're a healthy child like I was, I noticed that when I was young, I was protected. So were you, to a degree. But then we get to the age of knowing right from wrong, and we begin to talk bad, evil, we choose bad things, and we rip that hedge down. Now we need to get saved, born again. Say amen. We go along our life with no hedge, we're going through life. If we survive, then somebody leads us to the Lord. We say, Jesus, come into my heart. Another hedge right around you. This one with angels. Same thing, though. If the Christian doesn't get to a good church where they can learn the word, a Christian will start speaking all the nasty stuff that they're feeling, sensing, and they'll rip from the inside down that beautiful hedge that God has put up by the words of their mouth and the actions of what they do. So everyone, everyone say, not me. Now, what do we do? How do we build it back up again? I'm glad you asked that question. Prayer life. Meeting with God first time. As soon as you do, you get a hedge. The more consistent, consistent we become, the greater the hedge grows and quicker it grows. Now, how big can the hedge get? Size of a city block, size of a city. Hello? It depends on how faithful you are to God and talking to the master. See, God has no intention of turning his children over to the devil. But we do it ourselves. So everyone say, I got a hedge about me. And I'm not going to rip it down. So that's what happens to other Christians. Now listen to me carefully. This, is, this will make a good short clip. Other Christians get in trouble when they talk about other Christians. Because what are they doing? They're smacking the other Christian's hedge. Has thorns. Punch a couple of thorns a good time. 
And Satan knows this. So he'll get somebody to get you upset to another Christian, and he'll start talking, and blah, 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 blah. Your hedges will come down faster than anything. Not only that, but you're punching at another child of God, which is God's property, and you have just committed a high treasonable crime. That's why Satan has people talking about other people. How's our mouth be undisciplined? Because he knows we'll rip down our own life. I'm going to wait until I get some good amens. So what we do is we go to God and get his wisdom so he begins to discipline some of the areas that we so unknowingly let flop around. Come on now. I'm talking about me too. You don't think that I, I'm just talking about all of you, not me. No, you got to know yourself enough to keep yourself with God. Do you know yourself enough and how bad you would be without God? Then get yourself to God on a regular basis. Say amen. So let's read the scripture and let's have a good time. So in Job 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, by the way, this is B'nai Ha Elohim. This means angels. Not the sons of Seth and the Hoochie Coochie Mamas of Cain. That's a joke. Because there's only two teachings. There's teachings of giants, of the maid, of fallen angels and women. And the teachers that was Cain's group, breaking the covenant and having sex with the hoochie coochie women of whatever. And produce giants? Come on. There's a lot of weird stuff that people pass on to be the gospel. No, these sons of God. Now look at this. These sons of God came in to present themselves before the Lord. Why? Because every one of them ran and controlled areas of the universe under God's control. Your job was to come in on a regular basis and report what's going on. Now remember, Satan had a handful of these different ones from different places working with him on the planet. Now, who did the planet, who, did, who gave the planet to him? Adam. So now we're going to see, here's Satan back up in heaven after God threw him out of heaven. He's back up into heaven with the rest of the angels, yet he's a fallen being. How did he get there? Through Adam's authority. And look what he says. I don't preach myself happy. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? And Satan answered and he said, from going to and fro and walking down up in the earth. Walking back and forth in it. What's he doing? He's strutting his stuff. This is my planet now. This is my planet now. But it's what he says I want you to watch. Ah, oh, I got to take a drink. Hold on. So Satan answered in verse uh, 9 and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around about him? Now, if you know anything about Job, he was really out of sorts with God. But God loved him anyway and put a hedge about him. Not only did he put it about him, but continue to read. Around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side. And you have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions and increased his possessions in the land. That's how much of a hedge is around about you, your entire life your future, everything. Do not take your ease and do your own thing for God. Go and meet with God. Get it done. Let's get this work done and let's get out of here. Get this church full. Bring people here. When somebody says, I'm going to be here, you pray for them. Make sure that they're escorted here. Say, I'll meet you at the door where they're obligated to come. Because most people that say they'll come, guess who comes to visit them? To keep them from carrying out their word. You older Christians, you're working with younger Christians, your class, there's nobody in your class because you haven't been praying for them. Maybe you have. You have been watching over them. Everybody has responsibilities. And God helps us with them. Say amen. All right. So, did you see Satan acknowledge the hedge? If he acknowledges the hedge, it must be there. I know personally, 
when I started getting a hold of this teaching, I used to project my armor about 20 feet off of my body. And I'd have people walk towards me and they'd be slain in the spirit, dozens of them, just walking towards me. Do you remember those days? Oh, yeah. I'd blow. This is before I ever met Betty Hinn. I would blow on people and they did fall out of their chair. Now, how did that happen, Pastor Kerry? Well, God taught me that the power of God is limitless. And if you believe God and please him, he'll work limitlessly through you. And it's as much as you can believe, he'll work. Of course, it looked a little corny. And some of the people that I showed this to ran around and kind of gave it a bad name. I used to wrap up a little ball of paper and have people speak the name of Jesus at it. And then I'd line up about three or four people and I'd say, here, catch! And I'd just let it go in my hand and they'd all fall right over before the ball would even leave my hand. Hello? There has to be that contact point for them to release. Anyway, there's all kinds of powerful things. But see, that goes good in a Bible college. We taught that at YWAM here in Tacoma, and it's the powers of God and how to release the powers of God, and now it's all over the world. We had a chance to teach it at YWAM. What an honor. Brother Paul and I. Anyway, I'm finishing. A couple of points. Number one, church, did you notice that the devil acknowledged that God had put a hedge around about him? Two, how about you? We, when we are born, we have a hedge, and then we tear it down. When, then we get born again if we do. Then another hedge is placed back, and we can tear that down too. I know a lot of Christians are in very bad shape, and that's not including those that are watching. I'm talking about churches have quit. Things have gone down because everything else is in charge except God. And, you know, that's a disaster. Thirdly, if we don't get busy and study the Word of God and find out what these benefits are and walk with Christ, then we'll have a tendency to be a lukewarm Christian and go up and down. We'll have the roller coaster ride. We don't want to really have that. We want to be steady and steadfast. Can you say amen? The only one that can cause that is God. Fourthly, the only reason we get pounded on is because we stay in the flesh too long. You upset me. Let me ask you, why did you get upset? I don't know. Why do I upset you? See, most people get upset, they can't tell you why. And if they do, it's always a blame because we don't know enough about ourselves. Listen, you're supposed to be dead. If I'm dead, can you upset me? That's right. If I die daily, I mean... Nothing should be able to raise me up but God. To rise me at all but God. And that's the goal we're going after. To die out to our outward self, be sensitive to people, follow the two commandments, to love the Lord thy God with all your mind, heart, and strength, and to love your neighbor as God has loved us. No longer as you love yourself. That's Old Testament. Don't love your neighbor as you love yourself. <laughs> I'm sorry. Come on now. Laugh with me. Jesus tried to tell his disciples, that isn't working, is it, guys? Love your neighbor as I have loved you. In other words, you have to go past the flesh. You have to look past the no, no man after the flesh, folks. You shouldn't be getting mad at any of your family members, Right? We're all family here. Now think about it. You can choose your friends, but you cannot choose your... God chooses them. So this is a family. I'm not going to do everything that pleases you. I am sorry. But do I stop being part of your family? And this is what's wrong with a lot of the church. They're loving and natural love. They got a wrong idea what family is. And when somebody falls or makes a mistake, and I've made plenty of them, they lose everything because of it, because their life is focused on the here and now and not God. Say, oh, me. I don't want you to look at me. You can laugh with me, but I want you to look at him. I want you to see the God part coming out of me. I want to see the God part coming out of you. All of us have plenty of faults. 
Why concentrate on them? Take them to God and let him fix them. And finishing. The only reason we get pounded on again is we get outside our hedge. Five, we are to dwell in Christ. Amen. We're to walk from the inside out, no more from the outside in our feelings. Following Jesus. He's our shepherd, right? We don't wander away from our shepherd. We follow our shepherd. Right. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall. I shall not. You guys saying it with no faith at all. <laughs> the devil hear that? I shall not want. I shall not want. See, that's what's wrong with, you know, listen, what's wrong with a lot of us? We just mull over things. No, your words are covenant. Jesus said, every idle word that a man shall speak are covenant. You'll give an account of them. So why not make our words powerful? How many are blessed? Then say this with me and we'll be done. Say, I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. I can do anything God wants me to do. Because he'll help me do it. I'm spirit filled. I'm forgiven. I am filled with God's love. I believe Jesus is Lord and Satan's defeated. Now give the Lord a big hand clap. Will you? Yeah.